It's Shani on Shani Speaks Now. Hey there, Faith Fam. It's your girl Shani here, and I'm back with another episode of My Fill in the Blank Story, a live interview series where I aim to amplify the voices of women as they share their reproductive health journeys. This month, I had the honor to speak with fibroids fighter, women's health advocate, and filmmaker Erica Taylor. She shared her personal journey with infertility, how it led to her truly being a woman's advocate for health, and her up and coming documentary, Red Alert, The Fight Against Fibroids. I can't wait for you all to hear our conversation and really, really get into it. So stay tuned, stick around and check it out right now. For those who do not know me, my name is Shani Jones and I'm a speaker, I am a host, I'm a content creator and I'm a realtor in Orlando, Florida. But one of the things I have been become very passionate about most recently is just the case of women's reproductive health, fibroids, miscarriage, just anything that has to do with women in this area. And that is how this whole segment got started called My Fill in the Blank Story, where I fill in the blank with different reproductive challenges that a lot of women face, especially women of color. And I'm really, really excited today because I have a guest. Now, the last couple guests I've had have been in my sphere. They've been women that I know personally. I know their stories personally. But Erica Taylor, who's my guest today, she is someone that I don't know personally, but I have been able to make a great connection because we have a mutual friend, Sharice Nicole, who is such an amazing woman. And I love when dope women can connect other dope women. I had made a post and she tagged her and then I went and saw her page and I was completely blown away by the work that she's doing, by the film that she has, which we'll get into called Red Alert. And I was like, okay, she is someone that I have to talk to, that I have to get on live, and that I have to allow her to just share, share her story and also share the purpose that she is. In terms of how this all started, my journey has really started really back in 2021. Uh, just a brief history of my reproductive health story. Me and my husband were hoping to conceive and realized that something was not happening. I realized in September of 2021 that I had fibroids. And even though I had always had issues with my cycles and all those things throughout my life, I, I had no clue that I had fibroids until I was actually trying to have children. Uh, I ended up having to have a myomectomy at the end of that year, December of 2021. I was recovering the first half of 2022 when we found out very quickly that we were pregnant, which we were overjoyed because we thought we were going to have to go some sort of fertility route, IVF, IUI. We actually had the IUI scheduled for that April when I found out I was pregnant towards the end of March. Uh, unfortunately, we lost that baby. And of course, that was devastating. So we were trying again, hoping to be able to get back to that point only to discover that in September of 2022, I had another fibroid that was keeping conception from happening and ended up having to have another surgery December of 2022. And with all of that being said, I felt led by God to share my story. I just started talking about it on Instagram, just started sharing about my fibroids, sharing about the miscarriage. And as I shared, I felt more free. But what I realized is, as I'm sure Erica knows, when you share, people are more prone to share. And there's so many more people who are going through this than you realize. And a lot of them just don't talk about it because they don't think anyone else is going through it or they feel that they're alone. And I just really felt this need to kind of build community and allow other women to share their stories. And that's how this whole thing came to be. And I started it this year. And this is only my fourth one, but I'm just excited with just how so many women have such powerful and different stories. And Erica, who is my guest today, is no different. We have a lot of things in common in terms of her also being a speaker, in terms of her also being a host, in terms of her just being on red carpet, which is something we've also done. However, she's also a filmmaker. She has her own production company, which is Taylor Productions, and she has a documentary that is She's been working on very hard for the last five years, and we'll get more into that. But I want to give her the opportunity to introduce herself as well. But I want to give a very warm welcome to my guest today, Erica Taylor. Thank you so much for being with me. And just thank you so much for what you're doing in this space for women. Oh, thank you so much, Shani. That is like the most amazing introduction. <laughs> I really um, as you were telling your story, you know, I can relate to many parts of it. Yeah. So it's it's. We always need to connect with one another as women, but unfortunately, a lot of times we connect over pain. Yeah. 
But at the, you know, with that said, I'm glad that, you know, there's a common, there's a community available for women to go to who have been uh, suffering from fibroid issues and, and infertility and, and all of those reproductive health disparities, especially those that are plaguing the African-American community. Absolutely. Um, I'm glad that we were able to connect in that respect. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, so. I, as you said, I have been working on a film for quite a few years now um, called Red Alert, The Fight Against Fibroids, about my fibroid journey. And just to give you a little context, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about, you know, my diagnosis, but really the film was brought about because of the previous film that I had done with um, my produ producing partner, Jasmine Leva, uh, entitled The Invisible Vegan, which is currently on Amazon Prime where we talked about uh, diet and veganism um, yeah. and understanding or misunderstanding of that in the African-American community. And as I was talking about um, my health, I, I opened up about my fibroid story in that uh, documentary. And uh, after we released it, people started, women started reaching out to me and saying, thank you so much for opening up about your, your story. Thank you so much for talking about this out loud because I've been suffering in silence all wow. these years. And so after... After I got so much of that, um, I said, you know, I think I know what my next project is going to be. And simultaneously, I was dealing with, you know, some fibroid issues and surgeries and other um, situations myself. And so it was just a natural progression that I opened up that discussion. And once I opened it up, it was Pandora's box. I mean, there yes. was, you know, fibroid awareness communities out there that I connected with and more women started opening up about their diagnosis and um, women saying, you know, I'm having these symptoms. Could it be fibroids? And, you know, as an awareness advocate, I like to encourage them to go to the doctor, but we also want to make sure they're armed with the proper questions and um uh, information um, so they can have a, an educated conversation with their physician. So, um, so it's been an amazing ride that I'm still on that I hope yeah. I, um, as far as helping women to understand what's going on with themselves. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just been really rewarding. Um, but just to kind of go back and tell you more about my story, I was diagnosed with fibroids in 2008. Right. And that after uh, obtaining a second opinion. I had gone to get fitted for an intrauterine device as a form of birth control, but also as a form to control my cycles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was I was sick all the time, um, and I had so many different ailments that were related to my womb health. Um, and so I went to the doctor to try to get fitted for this device, and I screamed when she tried to to insert. Yeah. And you know, after she tried a couple times, and I was like, I can't take it anymore. Yeah. Um, she, you know, some women just can't wear these devices. And so, you know, I just felt like there was more to the yeah. story. So I had an opinion. I went to another physician, and she said that uh, she was more well-versed in fibroids and the commonality of fibroids mm. because she uh, female patients with them before. And so she diagnosed me as having uterine fibroid tumors. I was scared to death. I thought I had right. Like, what in the what? Tumors? I was yeah. like, nobody in my family family was talking about this stuff so what in the world you know correct so um as we tried to to learn more as I tried to learn more about my diagnosis and you know she began to treat my symptoms um she did things like cryosurgery which if you've never heard of cryosurgery it sounds like something out of a Batman movie right <laughs> and that's why they use freezing correct yeah it's it's the freezing of the cervix right. to try to get from uterine fibroids, which is an in-office procedure that was done. And so she did that, and that lasted probably all a bit of a month and a half, oh, maybe, wow. right back to where I began. Then she tried the Lupron shot. The Lupron shot is a, a uh, shot that women can get that makes your body think that you're in menopause. Wow. Now, here I was, wow. early yeah. 30s, like, yeah. wait, wait, what? Yeah. I was like, what if yeah. I forgets I'm not in menopause? What the hell? You know? Correct. And it's crazy because I actually, when I thought I was going to have to go the I, IUI or IVF route, Lupron is also something that they mentioned to me. And I thought it was so weird because I said, well, if I'm trying to have a child, why would you give me something to make my body think that I'm in menopause to then reverse it? It just sounds like so much yeah. that is, that's done to our bodies to manipulate them to do the things that they want it to do. Yes. It's very interesting. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I did that one time. It lasted for three months. I got hot flashes and I gained weight. I was pretty oh, much no. extent to, to how much that treatment worked. So then the next option she uh, suggested was that we do a laparoscopy where she goes in through my belly button and she takes a look, see and sees, you know, like, 
what's going on in there, how many fibroids I have. And then we agreed that if there was treatment that needed to happen at that moment, that she would go ahead and do the treatment. Well, Shani, <laughs> she did the laparoscopic surgery. I thought that this was going to be something where, you know, she looked in there, she saw some things, she'd take them out, and she told me I'd be back to work in a couple of days. Right. Happened. Of course not. Uh, yeah. So while, while she was in there, she noticed that there was a lot of scar tissue, likely because well, I had had, you know, so many fibroids and my, 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 my uterus was trying to protect itself. Mm -hmm. Scar tissue mm -hmm. way of trying to protect protect itself from any type of trauma Wait, and so trauma including surgeries and things like that recorded. and so you know with that and this is i think this may have been the, the, the first time i've said this but because i had so much scar tissue there's a likelihood that i could have been pregnant before and i didn't know wow. it and this result of that wow so um so i i had uh the laparoscopy and instead of removing any fibroids she took my appendix out so <laughs> i know <laughs> it's wild it is wild yeah yeah so you don't go into you know reproductive health surgery thinking you're going to come out without an appendix right so i was like wait what so you know so that was definitely something wild um for me and so um she didn't remove any of the fibroids she told me that i had a fibroid or two in my uh, uterine wall and so she felt like you know she didn't want to take anything out because it would lessen the likelihood that I'd be able to carry a child later. Mm. That may or may not have been a mistake. We'll just keep talking about the story, right? Yeah. Oh, um, also, uh, you know, while I was going through this, I was in an abusive relationship. Mm. That's just stacking on top of right. that I was already feeling every month for my fibroids. Um, you know, the person I was seeing at the time, we lived together, um, and he actually left town while I was recovering from surgery. Oh, wow. So that just made things even more worse because for women with fibroids, the stress Correct. level can increase. It can make, make your body just feel so much Absolutely. worse. Absolutely. Oh, so, you know, that was definitely a very difficult period of my life. Um, fast forwarding from that, um, it would be another, gosh, six years before I would seek any other treatment from my this all took place in 2008 so that that part of your story and yeah. real quick before we fast forward do you remember prior to that because I know a lot of times with a lot of women once their menstrual cycles start that sometimes they can see something that's going on their cycles are irregular or they're super heavy or they're super painful mm -hmm. do you remember when you got your cycle or throughout your growing up did you have any issues with that that made you think that maybe this could have been something that was happening even prior to you knowing anything absolutely when i thought back um you know i started my cycle kind of early on i was 11 years old right and um, you know, I, I think back to even just the first day it happened, it was extremely heavy, wow. you know, and you don't know how to handle yeah. that, but uh, here on top of that is that I didn't really have open dialogue with my mom about mm. cycles, the periods and things like that. We had health class in school, right? right? So, you know, I knew that there could be something that could be happening to my body, but I didn't quite know what. Yeah. I actually hid the fact that I started my cycle oh my for my mom gosh. two months. I was just in there stealing her pads. And <laughs> she didn't notice, which I'm sure, you know, at some point she knew something right. was missing. Right. So I just kind of went on a wing and a prayer in a, for a while, wow. uh, my cycle. Um, and then I started, I was so active. I was doing dance. I was doing gymnastics. Yeah. And so there was at a certain amount of time I could hide that from my mother. And so, um, you know, we, we, we did talk a little bit about it. Not a whole right. lot. You know, she put up with some the same pads she uses and that's it. Yeah. Uh, Oh, you know, we think when I think back to um, the conversations that could have been had, yeah. even at that, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot I feel like could have been avoided later on had we had an open dialogue about that. And that Absolutely. is definitely uh, the case in a lot of, you know, households, especially a lot of black, black Correct. households. You know? And I think I saw in some part of your documentary in the trailer, you even mentioned, like, why aren't we talking about this in schools? Why aren't we talking to kids about these things earlier? Because it's true. A lot of times if you talk about it earlier, it takes away some of the sting and the stigma. They do feel like they're comfortable to be able to come to you, whether it's a parent or an adult. But it also takes away some of that fear and kind of some of that wondering of what's going on if some of these things are discussed earlier or in your case, 
and in, in my case, I mean, I had terrible cycles from a very young age. And I remember my mom trying to take me to doctors and trying to figure out and being tested for cysts and different things. At the time, they didn't find anything for whatever reason. But I think a lot of it is just trying to figure those things out so that hopefully some of these things can be avoided where now we're not in our, you know, late 20s, early 30s, even early 40s, getting these surgeries and doing things that are a lot more abrasive to our bodies. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's just remarkable how we are okay with talking about sex education. We're okay with talking about STDs. We're okay with talking about erectile dysfunction and things like that, but we're not okay with talking about something that affects 80 plus percent yes. of African by age 50. Yes. I think I saw a statistic as well that by age 35, at least 50% of African-American women would have fibroids. Yeah. And then the statistic you're talking about is by 50, I think it's like 80%. Yeah. That is insane. So many women have had this. More than likely, if you have a spare of five people, two to three out of those women have experienced this or will experience it and just don't know it. So that is crazy. Yeah. Okay, so we can fast forward back into your story when you finally did get an opportunity. And one of the things I remember you talking about in terms of you not really seeking anything is obviously because of the type of work that you do, not everyone has these, you know, typical nine to fives where they have health insurance that is, you know, definite and that's gonna happen. A lot of it is not being able to get some of the care that you need because you don't have the coverage. And if I remember correctly, that was a little bit of a part of what may have been the reason why you didn't get a chance to kind of follow up from that time frame. Absolutely. This that's really a key point um, in my story. I, you know, have been a producer for 20 years now, yeah. and living out in Los Angeles, I was a, um, I started in television. I, I began my career in radio, but then I, I moved to television. I've had a very rigorous seven-day-a-week, you know, yeah. career for many years, and especially during that time, and it demanded a lot of things from me physically. Mm. So. Basically, I was, you know, working seven days a week. I was writing for shows. I was, you know, producing. I was interviewing, flying around, talking to celebrities. You know, so to have to go through this during that time in my life was really, uh, it was really tough. I can imagine. You realize, you know, when you have a very demanding job, we're always on the grind and the hustle. But when you're not feeling well during those times, you know, it's it, you feel stuck. You feel like you're you're working in mud. Yeah. You know, and. Uh pushing through pain every single day. And that is just not a good way to live. That's just not living our best life, right? So um, so I was dealing with, with my fibroid issues. I didn't have health insurance because when you work in, a lot of times when you work in entertainment, especially if you're an independent contractor, like many of us are, mm -hmm. you don't have, you know, you have independent health insurance. You know, now through the Affordable Care Act, you'll have health insurance. And depending on what state you live in, can depend on what type of programs that you're that are available to you. Right. And during that time where I needed to see doctors pretty often, I did not have, you know, health insurance. Mm. So, you know, there came a time where my symptoms were so worse, so much, so bad. And I had, you know, gone to um, the emergency room. Mm. Um, I felt like I was hemorrhaging at one point. Wow. Um, where I'm doing these things and I don't have health coverage. So you're getting a bill for thousands, yes. you know. And so you look for other alternatives for health care. Yeah. So came a time where, you know, we heard those commercials on the radio about women who had fibroids or fibroid symptoms and these clinical trials were available. Mm. You know, these were happening all over the country. Right. You know, they were happening in L.A. And so I decided that I would, you know, as a, a, a crash alternative, uh, listen to one of these ads and try to apply for a clinical trial. So I applied and I went online and they gave me an appointment to go to this clinical trial. So I showed up hoping for some type of result for these symptoms that I had that were getting worse and worse over time. Right. I I went to this place that looked like, you know, girl, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> I went to the doctor in the grocery store, like, what is this? <laughs> Old car, I run down. Right. So I checked in for my appointment and they put me in this room that was the size of a closet with just the exam table in there and a sonogram machine and you know this this girl comes in with this doctor this young you know young guy and this girl came in and she looked like a deer in headlights oh, i mean she, Lord. you know she looked scared to death like they had just uh. her from someplace in the mall and was like hey can you assist this doctor in this oh exam? no and so I was in this room having this exam. She looks scared to death. And the doctor comes in. He um, 
does the transvaginal ultrasound, which is the ultrasound that is the long wand. Correct. Yep. And yep. I'm here right now yeah. is the transvaginal most thorough. So he inserts the wand, and I'm starting to see, you know, him move around on the screen. And I see, you know, him making the X's where there's fibroids, wow. and he just starts oh. all these X's that I can't even count anymore. And he just goes, oh, honey. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, he's like, oh, honey, nobody told you? And I'm like, told me what? I'm sitting here like, he about to tell me I'm having twins? Like, right. <laughs> and so he's like, no, nobody told you? And I'm like, told me what? He said, there's so many tumors in here, I can't count anymore. Oh, no. What in the world? I was like, no, when, the last time I went to the doctor, she told me I had six or seven. And he's telling me, like, he can't count anymore? Oh like, gosh. what? Gosh. Yeah, so I was devastated. Yeah. He said, I should have had a hysterectomy years ago that the doctors weren't, you know, they lied to me. I should have, you know, I shouldn't have let them get this bad. Like, it was my fault. Oh, no. You know, and, I'm and just, I, I hate that a hysterectomy seems to be, like, the number one or one of the first things that they always want to do, especially when you're young and, and you may want to have a family. Exactly. And I was, you know, early to mid thirties at the time. And I was just, he was telling me that, you know, I should have had a hysterectomy. I'm like, I have not had, I don't have a boyfriend. Yeah. Let alone I have, you know, I, I haven't had a baby. I haven't frozen any eggs. And now you're telling me I shouldn't have a uterus. Are you kidding me? Right. Oh. You know, so it's just like, you know, what in the world? Yeah. So, you know, so he, um, you know, they basically sent me on my way and told me that I, I, I wasn't a candidate any longer for this clinical trial. Oh, wow. I went to, and by the way, the clinical trial was for uterine fibroid embolization, which was considered still a newer technique at that time. Right. But later on, I found out that it wasn't that new. And that's when they, they freeze the fibroids, hoping that they will shrink over time, right? No, actually, a uterine fibroid embolization is where they go in through your groin or through your wrist, oh. and they cut off the blood supply to the fib fibroid, because that's how fibroids grow. Right. grow. They right. estrogen and progesterone, and they fill up with blood, and that's how the fibroids work. But with UFE, they cut, cut off the blood su supply to the fibroid, and it shrinks the fibroid down to a scar. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. But I wouldn't learn that for years later. Right. So, you know, so remarkably, um, you know, I went back to my car. I cried myself out, you know, but I knew that wasn't the end of my story, Shani. I knew yeah. it. So, you know, I, I, I sought out even a, a second opinion later on after that. But that would be, you know, a few years later. It would be um, a couple years. Actually, no, I'm sorry. It, it was a few months later. Um, where the California adopted the Affordable Care Act, and I was able to get health insurance. Oh, good. So I I found a physician who um, specialized in fertility, and she said that she could take all of my fibroids out, save my uterus. I was so excited. Yeah. Looking forward to what was coming next. Um, I had the surgery, and unfortunately, I ended up hemorrhaging after the oh. surgery and recovery. And th is that when you found out you had like around 22 fibroids, I think it was? I did. I found that oh I had God. 20 Gosh. fibroids. Do you remember what size ranges they were? You know, I would asked her to, to show me pictures or to save the fibroids, and she didn't. So mm. I didn't, just said they were multiple sizes. Um, you know, so this was 2014 at the time. Right. So, you know, things were, you know, all over the place with me. I was stuck in intensive care for seven days wow. trying to get this hemorrhage because every time they tried to get me out of bed, I faded. You know, my high, my blood pressure was extremely high. My blood level was extremely low. Yeah. Um, pressure was very low. And we were, you know, my parents never left my side. Um, so we were really scared during that time. But I was able to pull through with God's help and a lot of prayer. And I... um recovered from that but again i was worked in entertainment when you work in entertainment and you're not working the show and you has to go on the show has to go yeah. on so that you don't have a paycheck you don't have you know insurance and so i was living off short-term disability and thankfully i worked long enough to get short-term disability right you know and so you know it was a really tough time during that time for me yeah i can imagine
-hmm. So once you've had that surgery, you've hemorrhaged, you're trying to recover, kind of where do you pick up from there? Because I know at some point you do find out that you were pregnant, but it was kind of in a unexpected way. Yeah. Well, 17, my then fiance and I were told by my doctor, I moved back to Dallas by then. So we, we were told that we didn't need to have a baby now. We needed to have a baby right now. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. So we um, we started trying in 2017 and we tried for two years unsuccessfully. And by the way, I want to add that, you know, by that time I was vegetarian. Remember I told you I, we had done yes. veganism. Correct. Well, I became vegetarian in 2015 and um, I, you know, was still eating meat. I was still eating goat cheese mm -hmm. and eggs. Mm -hmm. That was my, my two crutches. Right. So trying to have a baby between between 2017 and 2019 unsuccessfully but then in January of 2019 I decided to go 100% mm. vegan mm. and I cut out eggs I cut out the goat cheese I cut out soy as well because mm. I soy was a proponent of fibroid symptoms yeah. and by that my fibroids had returned wow so, um so I, I I I'd given all that up and in March of 2019 I was having a really, really tough period. You know, what I thought was a tough period. And as the days progressed, my pain got more and more intense. Mm -hmm. And I told my husband, I said, I think I need to go to the emergency room. Something's yeah. wrong. Yeah. Went to the emergency room, found out we were having a miscarriage. And even though, Shani, I was having a miscarriage, I was so excited that I had even gotten pregnant. Right. Because back, back in 2017, that the doctor said, it wasn't, wasn't an option. So we had 0.1% chance of yeah. getting pregnant. Yeah. And I, if I remember, was that because you had went to a wellness retreat, right? That you, was it at that point that you had kind of like done like a really intense exercise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we went to, I, I attended a wellness retreat with some girlfriends that weekend. And we had kind of an unexpected workout. And I worked out really, really <laughs> hard. And, um, even though it was great for my mind, body, and soul, that following week is when, you know, all of the you know, intense pain started and everything. And I found out I was having a miscarriage. So, yeah. you know, I can't really say that, you know, working out hard was the reason why, because right. I don't encourage anyone from working out if they're pregnant. But Absolutely. because of the fibroids, you know, was the reason why I had that miscarriage. Right. And so it was also a defining moment for me to say, okay, time for me to really start pre-production on Red Alert, the Fight Against Fibroids documentary. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, let's move into that. Um, and, you know, your story is phenomenal and obviously it makes sense as to why you get to this point. Um, obviously, you were working on another documentary. You share how essentially veganism changed your way of living and also made an effect and impact on your body personally when it came to fibroids, which everybody is, you know, body is different. But I do know there are certain foods and certain things that sometimes can contribute to and can feed fibroids. And for a lot of people, sometimes changing their diets or eliminating some things can make a difference. And for you, thank God, that was something that you recognize and realize. So you get to the point where you say this is going to be the next project that I want to work on, where do you start? Well, um, you know, I, I knew that there was some work being done in maternal mortality space in D.C. Right. So as I started doing research, I found out there was, you know, a big brunch happening, and then um, it was sponsored by the Black Women's Health Imperative. And so I had a friend who was connected with them, and so I attended this brunch in D.C. and, you know, had the conversations with, uh, different women in legislation about the documentary that I wanted to do. And they were just so excited about it. They were like, oh my gosh, we need this to happen. Yeah. Uh, ironically, many women in the room had been diagnosed from fibroids mm. or had had moved or had, you know, dealt with fibroids in some capacity. And yeah. so they really I was really encouraged by the conversations. So after, you know, that experience in DC, you know, I opened up, you know, more, um, streams of communication with Washington, D.C., and saw that there was legislation going down. There was, you know, the uterine, the Stephanie Tubbs Jones mm -hmm. uterine research, fibroid and research education bill, which was on the table and had been introduced um, or would be introduced that next year by uh, now VP Kamala Harris. Nice. Uh, she was a senator. And so they, there was support there for conversations about uterine fibroids. So I wanted to play my part as a uh, fibroid awareness advocate in, in the making and also as a fibroid um, patient 
to bring awareness to the issue. And that's when, you know, we I started the pre-production on Red Alert, the fight against fibroids. And we would subsequently uh, start our cameras rolling on November 1st of 2019. Nice. To that, I want to share that prior to that in September, I had found out that I was pregnant. Oh. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we lost the child again six weeks later because of fibroids. Wow. Yeah. And so I, I want to tell you, I didn't have insurance. So, you know, I often share that I have medical bills from both of those mm. uh, uh, miscarriages that, you know, stacked up to about like this. I had over $35,000 worth of medical bills. Yeah. Mis- suffered as a result of fibroid tumors. Yeah. So, and that's the part I think people don't realize is that on top of the fact that you're already dealing with the emotional aspects of things, the physical aspects of things, but the financial aspects of things can be terrible on top of that because you're already dealing with this. It's not something you want. You never ask for it. And unfortunately, business as usual, they still need to get paid for whatever it is that they did, whether it was something that you wanted in terms of service or not. Yeah. So in terms of your film, what were some of the main things or what are some of the main things that you focus on? I know there's parts of it where you're sharing your personal story. Obviously, you're talking to a lot of doctors. You're speaking to a lot of different women. Kind of how do you break down the documentary and what can people expect to see for those that are there? And yes, for those that see, she actually has the redalertmovie.com her website where you can see the trailer and find out so much more about the process of the movie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we talk on quite a few things in the documentary. Um, I'm so excited about it uh, because we've included uh, interviews from the top research scientists in the country. Um, Once I started doing my research, I saw that, you know, there was grants by the National Institute of Health for fibroid research, but it was only $17 million, I think. Mm. You know, yeah. that's it, you know, yeah. in terms of, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like erectile dysfunction or contraception that gets hundreds of millions of dollars in funding, something that's affecting African American so people, and, you know, by, you know, so many women and yeah. 70% of all women. Yes. Uh, it's only getting $17 million. So we felt we talk about that, um, the lack of funding, the lack of funding available for research and for um, education of uterine fibroids. Um, we talk about you know, the younger generations of women who will be affected by uterine fibroids and how we need to open up those conversations. Um, Along with me telling my story, I've opened up my experiences with video. So I take the audience with me as I'm dealing with this miscarriage, you know, as I'm praying to God and asking him to allow me to hold on to this child a second time, I'm taking the audience with me. And that was not easy when you're dealing with something like that to yeah. turn on the camera, press, press record, um, you know, so, you know, getting there, you know, dealing with the emergency room, you know, my audience is going to be able to go through that with me. Um, we talked to um, historians about the doctor patient relationship between African American women yeah. And OBGYNs over the years, over, you know, since since slavery, um, yeah. we take our cameras to uh, Montgomery, Alabama, where an artist there by the name of Michelle Browder has uh, constructed the Mothers of Gynecology yep. art exhibit. Um, and we talk about, you know, slave women in gynecology and Dr. James Marion Sims, who developed the practice of gynecology on slave yeah. women, uh, conducted these uh, experiments without anesthesia. Mm-hmm. on these same women and that's to help the audience connect to um the communication gap that we have between doctors and patients today um you know we talk about um the first known fibroids how how old are fibroids right fibroids are they date back to ancient egypt and ancient greece wow where people found you know fibroids in, in canopic jars in the in the tombs um you know these are things that people don't know and then yeah. Continuously, continuously ask yourself, why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we working on a cure? Why don't we know where these come from? You know, so me going through that experience, the fuel behind it, I was pissed off. Yeah, I, I can imagine. You know, I was upset that these conversations weren't happening. I was upset that the government isn't putting any money into telling me why, you know, fibroids have taken two of my pregnancies. Yeah. You know, that fueled my fire. And so it continues 
you know, uh, as we continue with the research and as we continue to raise money for Red Alert, the fight against fibroids uh, today, it's it's what's fueling, you know, me going, keeping keeping this project going, keeping on uh, the donation uh, search, uh, you know, building strategic partnerships and things like that. And I want to back up, up to something that you mentioned in terms of just the relationship between essentially mostly black women or women of color and doctors. And I remember, I believe there was one clip in the uh, trailer where a woman basically says that she had fibroids or she was pregnant and they were trying to give her some sort of medication that would harm her baby and they had no care about the fact that it could harm her baby. And I think even going back to, you know, obviously black women, slave women being used essentially as guinea pigs for a lot of these experiments that they were doing on women and the whole idea that black women especially just don't have the same feelings it's as if our bodies like we don't feel pain we are just so strong and just can take it tell me a little bit more about what you when you spoke to some of the doctors and even some of the women that you interviewed what were some of those conversations like and how has has there been any changes that you can tell that have taken place over time well you know it's so interesting you know the women that i spoke with we all bonded over our experiences because we felt like you know we were diagnosed with fibroids we weren't given enough information about the treatment options that you know could seriously affect us permanently yeah. uh, you know doctors tend to gravitate towards the treatments that they are familiar with correct many of us had the same experience of being offered a hysterectomy first and foremost or an invasive surgery which really could damage our uterus and keep us from having natural childbirth um so you know those are really uh, common experiences that women with fibroids have, unfortunately, um, we're not being given all of the treatment options because I'm here to tell you for anyone watching, if your doctor doesn't tell you about at least five treatment options for your fibroids or your fibroid symptoms, they're not telling you enough. Wow. There are treatments out there. You know, Myovan Sciences recently came out with Relagolix, a pill that helps with uh, fibroid symptoms. Mm. Uh, you know, and so a lot of people People don't realize that there is a pill to help yeah. you with your symptoms. That's not just ibuprofen or you know some form of blood thinner that's going to you know affect you in other ways um, or make you tired. But there is a pill out there that helps you with your symptoms. That's not going to make you infertile. Right. So you, we we want to know that these things exist. Or I'm mean, always having surgery as the first option as well. Exactly. You're always having surgery as the first option. Um, that's something that you definitely want to educate yourself on or talk to a fibroid awareness advocate or reach out to some of these other organizations out there that have this information available. Um, you know, so you've got uterine fibroid embolization. Um, one of the uh, organizations that I am um, uh, uh, an ambassador for is the Fibroid Fighters Foundation, and we offer, you know, they offer uterine fibroid embolization, and they also offer free Diagnosis, they offer the free, mm. not free treatments, but free, um, um, gosh, free uh, sonograms. Gotcha. Um, oh, especially during this month with uh, uh, Fertility Awareness Month. Yeah. Uh, they free free, um, free uh, sonograms. So definitely go, you know, take a look at Fibroid Fighters or USA Fibroid Centers and potentially get yourself checked out for free, which, you know, if that was something that I had available to me back when I didn't have insurance, yeah. it could yeah a lot of trauma and that part is huge because i think people don't realize you know if you do have insurance a lot of times you get a woman's wellness exam once a year however they're only checking your cervix now they're only doing um i can't think of what it's called the other exam that i can't think of right now uh every two or three years but mm -hmm. they're not doing ultrasounds they're not doing sonograms and you can't see fibroids without those things that's and i think that was my experience. You know, I'm not much of a complainer, even though I always had terrible cycles and my OB knew that. After a while, I stopped mentioning it because it seemed as if nothing nothing could be had, nothing could be done. And when I started having issues with fertility, essentially she just referred me to a reproductive specialist thinking, well, you know, maybe you just need to go a different route. And in the first conversation, that doctor was able to say, no, you sound like you have fibroids and endometriosis first time that that was something I ever thought was a possibility, but it's because I didn't scream, yell, get angry, ask for any other opinions because I trusted the doctor that I've seen for years, believing that they know what's best. And I know one of the things that we kind of talked about offline is even just really advocating for yourself and, you know, asking those questions and doing a little bit more because sometimes your doctor, they may mean well, but they don't always know. That's right. You know, doctors are people too. Correct. That's a, a 
had with many physicians is that doctors are people too. So we have to think about the fact that, you know, some of them, you know, are, they do have, good, they all have good intentions. I'll say that, yeah. but you want to remember that they have patient after patient after patient. Yep. So you make sure that you come armed with the right questions to ask them, or you even, uh, you know, if you know you're having some period issues, heavy periods, you're having some, some stress, you're having uh, anemia, you're always tired, or you're always craving ice, um, something like that, you need to say, you know what, I want a sonogram. I want a yeah. transvaginal sonogram. And you insist to your doctor to give you that transvaginal sonogram. Um, if they do not, it's time for a second opinion. Absolutely. Because large likelihood that you could have uterine fibroids, but that's the transvaginal sonogram will show you more of how many fibroids that you have Correct. versus the LE sonogram, which is what you know, we're used to seeing with pregnancy mm -hmm. and things. While that will show you, it won't show you as much of the transvaginal sonogram. Yes. Believe that, you know, this is something that also starts with uh, not just patient self-advocacy, but also in legislation. Mm. Um, to, we need to push our legislators to make things like a transvaginal sonogram a, 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 a necessity with along with that pap smear that we're getting every couple years or every year. We need that's something that needs to happen is at least a sonogram or a transvaginal sonogram, especially for black women yeah. who encounter these issues more more so than any other race of women. Yeah. So this starts at the legislation legislative level um and trickles all the way down to the patient self-advocacy level and while we're kind of on that because this is something i wanted to make sure i got into at least a little bit how can people join the fight you know this is something that obviously you're super passionate about you've been able to make a lot of those connections you've been able to be in a lot of those circles for those of us that live in you know various states where there's laws that can be very different. I know for me being in Florida, you being in Texas, we have been dealing with some very interesting political figures that can make some of the things that we want to do a lot more difficult than other places. But what can we do to kind of join that fight or to be an advocate in our own special ways that may make a difference when it comes to either legislation or getting the word out? What would you suggest? Absolutely. So, you know, I like to always shine the light on my sisters who are also in the fight. Um, while we're developing Red Alert, the fight against fibroids, first and foremost, I definitely want to tell people, get involved with Red Alert. Go to redalertmovie.com, um, submit your name down at the bottom. Um, you know, we have newsletters that will be launched later this year and other um, events and activities. Um, I also want to point you toward um, the uh, Uterine Health Guide which was developed by My Advanced Sciences and Pfizer Incorporated. Um, Red Alert is really proud to be a community partner with the Uterine Health Guide, um, joining a few other organizations who want to make sure that we have um, information out there about uh, period health, period yeah. poverty. Yeah. Uh, I encourage people to go to uterinehealthguide.com. Uh, it helps you kind of open up the conversation about period health with uh, audiences that are young and audiences that you know, maybe, you know, a little older, uh, but it helps us to understand those things that we're not well versed in because we didn't cover them in health class. Yeah. So we, we want to educate ourselves through the Uterine Health Guide. Um, I also want to make people aware of organizations like the Fibroid Foundation, which is one of those more veteran organizations uh, that deal with fibroids. Uh, Sateria Venable, who started Fibroid Foundation, is so incredibly um, passionate about what she does, and she is always um, pushing for legislation. I know that uh, they just introduced legislation uh, to make May uh, Women's Health Month. Wow. So the menstrual health yeah. month. Yeah. So... That's awesome. That definitely passes through. And then also the White Dress Project with Tanika yep. started the White Dress Project, and she's been very passionate about empowering women to be advocates themselves for uh, fibroid health. Uh, and then also, like I mentioned, the Fibroid Fighters Foundation. Um, we definitely want to uh, get women more educated about UFE and all the different treatment options that are out there uh, for women who've been diagnosed. I want you to know all the treatment options so yeah. that you what's best for you. I also want to help dispel the myths out there about fibroid treatment options. Like with UFE, you can't, they say you can't get pregnant. Yes, you can. You can yeah. definitely, you know, and so you need to understand what it means once you have uh, that scalpel 
uh, you know, on your, your uterus, you need to know what that means as well. So um, those are different different avenues that women can take to gain information. Um, I am always available. I love for women to reach out to me on the DM um, on IM. I'm, I'm on IG. Um, you know, I want them to let me know what's going on with them. If they've been diagnosed and they have questions, I'd be happy to answer some questions for them or point them in the right direction as yes. well. So as we kind of wrap up a little bit, I want to share or find out where are you in your journey now in, in terms of just, you know, your fertility and continuing on that journey and also tell people how they can contribute to Red Alert and how they can make this documentary truly come to life and then also leave us with how they can get in contact with you for those that want to connect with you on DM and just want to continue to see all the things that you are, are doing. Absolutely. So, um, I'm sorry, wait, what was your first so question? Part of one was, where are you now in your journey? Okay. So, um, so now, you know, I'm dedicating, you know, my time and effort to being a fibroid awareness advocate. Um, it's a tremendous responsibility. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, the fertility side of it, um, I'm giving, I'm, I'm giving as a way of, um, uh, dealing with what I'm dealing with, with infertility. Yeah. Um, Giving has always been a way for me to feed my own soul, my own spirit, yeah. and so that, that helps me to deal with infertility. It is very easy, and it's also okay for women who are suffering from infertility to feel selfish. Yeah. It's okay to feel like, I don't want to go to this baby shower. I don't want to, you know, rejoice in this moment. Yeah. Um, you know, it's okay to feel that way because when you're dealing with infertility, you feel like you're on an island. Even yeah. though there are countless other women who are dealing with it, um, it's really it's a difficult thing to to deal with um, and so it's important for you to know your options um, I had a conversation with uh, the beautiful Calais Stewart actress yeah, Calais Stewart for um, for break the silence break the behavior on YouTube um, another uh, platform that I, I utilize um, but we talked about egg freezing she is an yeah. egg and she's a huge candidate for women freezing their eggs. She's frozen her eggs. So I want women to understand that that is an option available to them and they need to consider it. And don't think that you have plenty of time um, because tomorrow, you know, as, as you know, it's not promised the infertility so you know i spend my time you know educating women loving on women who are going through this um you know we have taken a bit of a break because we went at it for many years yeah uh, it's in god's hands at this point absolutely so know that i am also being fulfilled by making my pain my platform absolutely. So i hope that in that respect that the words that i say in my experience um and what i've been through would help other women as well so i agree i think that my my motto lately has been god making you know beauty for ashes and sometimes as you share and as you allow others to share and as you do and give like you said it can make all the difference as you're continuing to go through the journey so thank you so much for sharing that and being so honest about that and for those that want to donate to red alert and to you yeah. know add to the funds to allow it to take place how can they they do that Sure, they can go to redalertmovie.com. Um, I would always encourage them also to go right through Instagram. Red Alert Movie is right here on Instagram. Um, you can also go through my Instagram at I'm Erica Taylor. Um, I would love for you all to follow both of those profiles because I'm always updating uh, those profiles with information on fibroid awareness, where we are in our journey, uh, where we are with legislation, where we are with our film, um, you know, travel with us. We'll be going to Malawi, South Africa to film. Wow. We'll be going to film and so I'll definitely be doing some live from there and um, uh, taking people on the filmmaking journey with me. Um, you know, I'm excited, awesome. you know, to see them. So yeah, and, and do you have a time frame of when you're hoping that you might be able to release the documentary for people to be able to see it, enjoy it, and get that word out? Listen, if I could have been <laughs> done yesterday, I've been a long haul, and, and a lot of times when I talk to people uh, about Red Alert, and they're like, "Oh, when's it going to be done?" Because that's the first right. thing everyone wants to know. Right, right. right. Um, you know, it's it's been a work in progress, and it takes money to get this done, yeah. and so it depends. Our fundraising efforts. Um, we've been, you know, getting partnerships um, with with filmmaking, with uh, fibroid awareness, and they've been helping to contribute towards our efforts. So it just kind of depends on our rate of filmmaking, our, our rate of fundraising, yeah. as to, um, when the film's going to be done. We are past our original deadline, so um, we're hoping that by the end of this, this year, hopefully by the fall, we will have have this film completed and on its journey out to get out into the ether to help them the 171 million women who are suffering from uterine fibroids wow 
Well, I'm excited. I'm excited to see it come to fruition. I also wanted to do this, this live and let you know that I will be donating to make sure that I can be a part of helping this movie go forward. Again, when I watched the trailer, just because of my personal experience, obviously, but also just the opportunity to talk to you and to be able to connect with you, I realized just how important this is. Documentaries take time. I think that's another thing. Really good documentaries sometimes span years. Yeah. So I think that's another part of it. It does take a lot of time. You are covering so many important topics, so I can only imagine how much it is to kind of tackle all those things. But I really yeah. just want to thank you for just being here, for all the advocacy that you're doing behind the scenes, the things that we don't know about educating women allowing them to be seen allowing them to be heard and just really supporting them through your journey and also putting some of their journeys kind of on the map so i am a newbie in this space so i am definitely gleaning a lot from you where that's concerned but i'm so glad that you didn't think of it a small thing to take the time to speak with me today i really really appreciate it and for those of you that really um just resonated with this series my fill in the blank story please continue to follow my instagram is at shanice speaks now and i would love for you to follow and continue to see some of the other stories that are covered and that will be covered um, in the month of June on June 4th actually I have my mammogram and breast cancer story of a 40 year old woman who went to her first mammogram and found out she had breast cancer so those are things that are crazy and just affect our bodies in ways that we don't uh, realize and understand so I'm looking forward to that and to really sharing other stories as we go but I'm just really really grateful to have you on here Erica I know this will not be the last time that we talk even if it's not here on Instagram but I have a feeling that this is a connection that will continue and I will definitely reach out to you if I have questions as I continue to kind of navigate my way within this space uh, if people want to connect outside of that I know you mentioned the red alert .com. your mm -hmm. Instagram is at I am Erica Taylor I'm I am Erica Taylor and then also at red alert movie so those are the ways that they can find you connect with you and please be sure to visit that website to join so you can be connected to some of the events and things that may come either in your area or that may be going on and please pledge to donate so that she can continue to get the funds she needs to allow this movie to hopefully come to fruition soon because I I am excited uh, I, hopefully, maybe if it's even open and available to me, I'd love to come see it premiere whenever that time comes. So I will, I will make that trip. Oh, so oh, keep me posted for um, sure. I would love, that would be a lot of fun. But thank you so much. You are so graceful, so poised. Uh, obviously, I'm I'm gleaning off of that because we are fellow people in just kind of that entertainment space. But it takes a lot for you to be in that space and to share so personally about your story. And I think that's the thing that people also have to realize is that um, this is a personal story. Some people are uncomfortable with hearing about these things. Some people choose to share. Some people don't. But when people do, they're really putting themselves out there for sometimes judgment, for people's opinions, for unsolicited advice, so all those things. So thank you so much for just being willing to brave those things and just really being an advocate for those of us that that need it. So I really, really enjoyed this conversation. And for those of you that watch, thank you. For those of you that will watch, thank you. I will definitely have this available in a week. So on Friday, I will have this posted up on my YouTube. I'll also share it with Erica if she wants to share it on her YouTube page as well. Uh, my YouTube is Shanice Speaks Now channel. And Erica, what is your channel so that people also know your YouTube as well? Sure. It's ELT Uptown. Awesome. E -L -T Uptown, but Red Alert also has a channel, Red Alert Film and Advocacy. I definitely, please feel free to follow that as well. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I know that we are almost at that one hour mark, but this has been such an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I wish everyone watching a great rest of your Sunday. And I look forward to just continuing these conversations. Thank you once again, Eric. I really appreciate it. Annie, thank you for your heart. Awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. Take care. Have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Erica, thank you again for sharing your story with us and for sharing so much knowledge with us as well. We cannot wait till your documentary, Red Alert, is released. And if you'd like to share your story live, remember you can email me directly at hishanee at shaneespeaksnow.com or DM me directly on Instagram. Didn't get a chance to watch? Well, you can listen wherever you listen to podcasts on Shanice Speaks Now, the podcast. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to my channel. And remember, always keep the faith and let the Lord fight your battles.